I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 9. It's uh, where we're hanging out right now. We had a really interesting uh, story that we read on the last podcast about this. Um, I don't know. I was calling it the stubborn spirit. You know, the, you got to have some serious prayer, apparently. To Well, the disciples couldn't drive it out. And so they come to Jesus privately and he's like, yep, that can only come out in prayer. But you're also seeing a lot of problems with the disciples grasping what's going on. I mean, he just had this encounter with Moses and Elijah up on the hill. They're glowing. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, Peter's like, hey, it's this is good. This is good. How about some shelters? <laughs> but, <laughs> Let's so, build some uh, tabernacle. But you got to remember in these three. Jesus act like he didn't even, didn't even hear him on that. Well, right. Yeah. And, because you got to remember when Jesus, the first time he, he broke it to him that he came here to die. Well, you know, Peter's like rebuking him and he actually calls him Satan. We had that happen. But he, he tells them three different times in these three chapters that he's going to die. He came here to die. And their idea of greatness is just shattered. And it, even when he did do what he said he was going to do, and Peter argued with him, the first thing Peter did was adios. Yeah, after he <laughs> said he wouldn't. I'm out of here. Yeah. After he said, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll die with you. Yeah. And he, no, you're going to But you know me. what I think the watershed for Peter was? Is remember when the garden, when they first came to get him, he pulls the sword out. And he takes yeah. a swipe at this guy and cuts his ear off. Yep. And then when Jesus puts the ear back on, says, put put the sword away, son. That would have been enough for me to stay. Well, right. <laughs> but instead, he thought, well, what's the that. point? I mean, he thought. Well, you think that, but look, it, it's hard to wrap your head around the human limitations. It's like, you don't know the difference in, in God is and us. And he says it in this story in Mark 9 where he says, when the guy says, well, if you can help me, this was verse 22. Yep. Because this, from childhood, his his son had had this spirit and it had thrown him into the fire, the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And I brought up the point, I think, in overtime where it said, if you can, said Jesus. And he was either questioning sarcastically or he was saying if you can because he said everything is possible for him who believes so the difference peter and, had and, in his mind and, let's kill them all that, that's what we do give me my sword let's kill well, well right it's, instead of convert them all right but before we converge i just wanted to say that with god everything is possible because look a, a chapter yeah, modern day jace you think about the people that are charging us with false charges, this and that and other, you know, been doing with 40, the last 45, 50 years. But you, you can't get to the point where you say, well, let's let God kill them all and be done with them. All right. You just have to be patient. Well, let me make this point, though. In the next chapter, I mean, I'm looking ahead on with the rich young ruler. Look, there's also a statement here that in 27 of 10 that Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. I mean, we'll get to that. But it says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So I just want to make a point. Three times in a chapter and a half, we have him radiating, glowing on the dark on a mountain with dead guys a thousand years before, roughly. And you have these two profound statements. Well, the difference in God and us is we're, we can do some things. But he's like, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible. So they should be alleviating their fears and their understanding should be becoming clear. But the reason I read, I think I read this in the, in the overtime, but I also bring this up, you know, for the next podcast, because in verse 32 of nine, it says they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Well, what did he just say? That the son of man would die. And he would be buried, in three days he would rise. So what what are they not getting? Go ahead, Zach. You had a comment. Yeah, I think uh, what they're not getting is 
So it's one thing. It, it, it would be one thing to say, look, we're, we're about to go fight these boys and you might lose your life. And, but Hey, we're in it for the right reasons. We're going to take this thing by storm and people can get on board with that because there's the possibility that they may, may actually win and get liberation. And so the, probably what they're thinking is, Hey, if I die trying to fight for liberation, you know, at least, at least I'm, I'm dying for something that matters. But what Jesus is, is calling them to is, is not that he's, he's telling them like, I'm like, we're, we are marching in to our death. And it was probably just like, wait, what? Like, I'm thinking Peter's probably hearing this thing and wait, what is, you, you're, you're preemptively saying we're going to be killed. Like the, you're going to die. You're the, you're the one we're following and you're going to die. They probably just didn't have room. What you're discussing. In their, in, what you're discussing, Dash, is the atheist manifesto. That's what they're saying. I mean, the, he the, he's not going to be able to do this or do that. They they they. The, you're looking for faith, and and the atheist manifesto is saying the same thing his disciples said. No way. But you it, got. But it you, just won't work. Yeah, but but. And, and to 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 defend them somewhat, I mean, you can kind of understand why they thought the way they thought when Jesus is telling them, "Hey, I'm going to die," and then the next thing he says is, "Hey, see these little kids? Yeah, you got to be like a little kid. Oh, you want to be first? Well, you got to be last." So he's taken every single one of their assumptions about power, about power oh, exactly. dynamics, and Jesus, yep. and he's doing this. He said. It's actually like that. That still goes on today. If you want to be the greatest, yeah. you got to be a servant. You you just think about that. It's like Missy and I was talking about this last night because, you know, we have a little baby now, and we're we're just awed every day because it's a reminder of how we all go through this process. And she made a good point because these childlike qualities, the curiosity, open mindedness, and courage that you see. Mm -hmm. from a from a kid even when they first put something in their their mouth to eat it you know for their they have the bottle okay we we get that we get how the woman's anatomy is and we we that's that's quickly uh applied but then when they eat real food what missy said she had a she had a funny illustration the first time he opened his mouth well he has no idea what you're fixed to stick in there. <laughs> and he's just like, it'd be like you going to a restaurant, putting a blindfold on and just say, go for it. That's something I would never do. Cause I have no idea what they were. You know, I just don't, we don't trust people. We want to like what we like. And when you see, you know, so you start realizing there that some, you know, some fear is helpful just like they, with a kid on how they, they learn through pain and they say, Oh, don't, don't do that again. You know, I mean, Missy, she thought, boy, he loves this chair the other night. He just, he hangs out at that chair. Well, I went over and looked at that chair. I said, I wonder why he likes this chair. Well, I looked down and there were little bitty pieces of leather missing. And I said, I know why he likes this chair. He's chewing on it. I said, he's eating this chair. <laughs> she said, no, he's not. When she came over and looked, she said, Oh, <gasps> I said, yeah, yeah, that's why he likes the chair. He's bit by bit. It, and just, she's like, oh, no, what is this made of? I was like, leather. I said, I think he's a steak eater. Yep, he's good to go. <laughs> he's just starting on the outside, working his way in. It might not be too good for the digestive. Well, I know. We watched him for two well, days. That's, that's called said, roughage right that's there. That's roughage. roughage yeah. is good. Real roughage. roughage yeah. This is where Ooh, you need, I was, to, I was, need to keep him away for get rid of that chair. I think. <laughs> yeah, we've had that conversation. Because <laughs> yeah. it went from panic to like, well, you live and learn. We're all learning together. We're learning together. He's eating the chair. That's a problem. <laughs> I have and, dogs. Dogs that are eating chairs, but if human beings, I would, I would say, no, we get rid of the chair. There's the only option we have. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, but to Zach's point, he is, he is trying to get them to wrap their head around. This is not what you think. And greatness is redefined. And look, God's greatness is better than anything that you can come up with. That That's why this, is the greatest yeah. religious movement in the history of the world because 
You got to remember, it, it is true. It does produce character. It is a better way for society to live. Immortality is riding on it, but they having a, as all humans do, having a struggle with anything that will deliver you and give you immortality. It's just a well, because I, I it's think tough, the tough problem concept. is. It, the, well, the reason why is I think because they were it, it, when they hear immortality, that what they're missing is they 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 think that that it's the immortality that is the prize, but that's it's not immortality. It's not life forever. It's life forever in the presence of God. So so God is the prize. I think that's what the Pharisees and a lot of, a lot of these guys. Did. I mean, we all struggle with this, right? And I think that's what we we see this paradox that Jesus is unfolding in the kingdom. I mentioned in the last episode, Jesus mentions the kingdom 52 times in the book of, uh, I think 52 times in the book of Matthew. And he's, the kingdom is bringing forth a paradox that, and what a paradox is, it's a, it's a perceived contradiction, but upon further investigation, you realize that it's not a contradiction. So it seems like a contradiction to say, if you want to live, you got to die. Or if you want to be first, you got to be last. Or you know, got to be like a kid. And like these all seems like, like like they don't make sense. But then when you see the very nature of who God is, you see God actually living out what He's calling us to. That's Philippians two, right? Christ, who being in the very nature of he God, has, he has he, to uh, get in the middle of the mindset that God really doesn't love us, and that's why He sent Jesus. He didn't send Jesus to condemn us. It's hard for them to realize he's trying to give you life. He's not trying to yeah. condemn you. That's that's hard. That's a hard concept for humans to, to yeah. have. One author, one author said that the problem defined is this. It's, it is the worship of self is the problem. So if you understand that the problem is the worship of yourself, which if you just run that out, the reason why that's a problem is because I'm not built to be worshiped i'm a finite creature if you worship me i can't like i can't handle that like i just can't i can't sustain reality i'm not a god and so that's the problem and if that's the problem with humanity then the solution is to die to self if the if the problem is the worship of self then the solution has to be to die to self so there is a in this paradox it's not we're not being asked to do something that's logically incoherent or that makes no sense it actually makes perfect sense. And you know this whenever you live out a life that is that is overflowing and a life of love, then you realize, man, like when I when we adopted Ruth, you'd say, Well, you got four kids, Zach. You just added another one to the mix. That's gonna she's gonna take up the love that you have to offer the other kids. But something profound happened when we adopted her is that she actually like love is exponentially growing in our family. She added love to it. And that's the nature of love is that it's overflowing and that it, 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 it can be expanded. It's not a it's not a finite resource. And that's who God is. And that's what we're being invited into. Yep. And and when we when we're pulling inward and we're selfish, then we become like that black hole and we just pull in everything around us. And we look back after f- five or 10 years of doing that and we're like, we're isolated or lonely or miserable. Did we get to do the things we want to do? Yeah. And it never fulfilled us. Yep, it yeah. never fulfilled us, and that's the paradox that Jesus is bringing forth in the gospel of the, ki- of the kingdom. That's I, yep. I believe that is the core of the whole thing. Yep, you are correct, my I man. Agree. Let's take a break. So, Dad, from time to time on the podcast, we have uh, what I guess in most circles would be called the awkward conversation about men's underwear, uh, because one of our sponsors is Tommy John, and you said this before, but I want to ask you again because we get a lot of listeners that come in at different times when you tried on your first pair because for a while we hadn't got you some but we finally did and you tried them on and you walked out or walked past mom what what was the what was hers it's always heartening to realize when a 74 year old woman you walk by and she goes wow <laughs> it just it just helps your manhood what can i say you walked a little taller after that yeah. didn't you? and so you give the credit to the tommy johns because the first time you had ever worn them uh Dad can agree now with what I've known for years because I've been a Tommy John fan long before they sponsored our podcast, uh, that they're super comfortable. Uh, they have a no wedgie guarantee because they don't roll up at the waistband or they don't ride up either. So they're fantastic underwear. They've sold over 18 million pair. And I love even the loungewear they have because it's super comfortable. 
So they've got a Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free, guarantee. So you got nothing to lose uh, to give these guys a try. Here's what you do. You go to TommyJohn.com slash Phil uh, right now, and you're going to get 20% off your first order. So that's great. Saving you some money. 20% off TommyJohn.com slash Phil. TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. So my my point was, you know, how do you make a statement that everything is possible for him who believes? Why were they not getting it? Because it's hard for us to get past our present circumstances to have faith. Because we're looking around thinking, well, this is this is not going well. And what's contributing to a lot of that is, you know, he gets into talking about being a having a childlike attitude. And, you know, the, the next paragraph. Read, read that 33 through 37 days because we've alluded to it a couple of times. But read that whole text. Well, he says uh, when they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Which, by the way, there's the Jedi Jesus mind trick again. How would he know what they were talking about? All right. But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. I mean, they they've completely missed it. It. It's affecting their prayer life, their faith, their and their trust. Now they they being, were arguing with the teachers of the law. Yeah. Now they're arguing with each other. Yeah. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must become the very last and the servant of all. Now just look, we've read that a hundred times, but if if your track instructor came out and said, Okay, here's the way to greatness. <laughs> we're gonna start a race, and whoever finishes dead last is the winner. They would fire him immediately. <laughs> but I mean, that, that this is why they're having. Yeah. I mean, we're, they're easily thrown under the bus. But when you're looking at your current situation, oh, you're exactly. like, this guy's an idiot. What's right. he talking about? Right. Wait, serving? Right. What? That's what you're wanting us to do? Look, and it gets worse because two paragraphs later, he's going to say after he brings up about the kids here, because he's wanting them to leave a legacy and not become legends. Yeah. And that's the difference. I mean, some preacher said that one time, but it's true. Because they're talking about who's going to be the greatest legend from this point on. And he's like, no, I'm going to affect everything from your marriage, which he talks about, from your kids to the people that you're helping. I mean, you're going to be my servants and we're going to change the world for the better. And we're going to live eternally as a forever family. That all sounds great on paper, but you're looking at thinking, but you want me to finish last? You want me to be mm. like a child? That, and then he that says. That would be a good sermon title, Jay. Uh, Legend or legacy? Then, then two paragraphs later, yeah. he's like, oh, and by the way, before you cause a kid to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown out in the lake. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Because you'd be better off if you make it to heaven without a hand. Well, all of a sudden, they're looking down at their hand thinking, what's this guy talking about? This is way too, this is way, way too out there and crazy and radical. So to finish this, in verse 36, he took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me and so it's just so what he was saying there is i'm the illustration of this child because the father sent his child here for you to embrace see how he's using that illustration which i thought was so powerful and you think about it in our culture this is not even as meaningful i don't think as it was in that culture because children I mean, they didn't hardly recognize them until they got a certain age because you didn't know whether they were going to live or die. Or, I mean, it's a different way of viewing children. And, right. they, and they didn't have any, like, you know, Jesus, that's why we don't know anything about his childhood. Because, well, and to it, your point, in 1013, you know, Mark is famous for telling these stories within a stories within a story. Mm -hmm. He's going to bring them back up. Yep. And, and to, to my point, when he said uh, in 14 of 10, he said, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs yeah. to such as these. I tell you the truth: anyone will not receive, who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, will never enter it. And to your point, Al, 
a couple chapters later, he's going to tell them a parable about that represents what you just said. Right. If a guy has a vineyard and he sends these representatives, yep. you know, and they kept robbing him. And so finally he sent his child. And guess what? They killed him. They killed him. What, so he's, he's bringing up that theme. So what I was going to say and what I did in the, in the last podcast in overtime was ask the question how prayer and faith work together because life is filled with fear. And the disciples, did, they were uncomfortable when Jesus started saying he had to die because what this does is it introduces pain into the kingdom and difficulty and that God is going to take us through it. But we're creatures as humans that we want us, we, we always want pain and difficulty be, to be taken away from us. We don't want to walk into that. And so I brought We don't want to suffer. Yeah, I brought right. up a point that the reason they were having difficulty with this, this miracle in Mark 9 is that it seemed like a dangerous, violent, uh, scary situation for, for a guy to be in with, with having a, a son that's violently going into convulsions and foaming at the mouth. And so they're trying to heal him. They couldn't do it. And they pull Jesus to the side and say, why couldn't we do it? And he's like, well, that kind comes only through prayer and fasting. And I brought up an example in the Psalms. You can find a lot of comfort because David and others seem to pray when they were angry or when they were fearful. And there was a little outline. I heard a sermon from Psalm 3 that I brought this up, and I, I, I think it was noteworthy. And just to read it again, in verse 1, he said, O Lord, and, th and this was, now just think of his current situation. This was a Psalm of David when he was fleeing from his son Absalom, who was trying to kill him. And take this throne. Now, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's a pretty difficult situation in life if your son's trying to kill you. I don't know how any more difficult it could get. Yeah. And so he prays, oh, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? And we're later going to find out that there were thousands. And that's how we're attacked physically. We are to this day, even today. But we're also, they were attacking his character because in verse 2 it says, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him because of his past. And look, we all struggle with having to live with our past. Yep. People, that's the first thing they bring up. Even if they know your past or not, they know we're all sinners. And they're like, you're a hypocrite. Because they're deducing, correctly so, that we all have baggage. Which is why Jesus came. We're all hypocrites. <laughs> yeah. So then he prayed verse three though, and I, so that's kind of why we are fearful because people do attack us. The evil one does attack us. People attack us physically. They attack us spiritually. They attack our character. But he prays, and this is kind of the he kind of gives a four point way of understanding prayer and faith, despite our current conditions. If if they're fearful or or we're having trouble understanding why is the Lord allowing this to happen in yep. my life. Right. It, it takes the text uh with meaning you're sure of what you hope for and certain of yeah. what you don't see. Right. It, so he it, says, but you are a shield around me. And the shield implies that he's not going to take you away from the storm of the battle. He's going to take you right in the middle of it. That's why you need a shield. If you're headed forward, it makes you think of all those verses that says we're not a, like those who shrink back and are destroyed. And you're a shield around me, O oh Lord. You bestow glory on me. So it's not in his, he wasn't looking for at his glory. And this is the king talking. Right. But he's like, for the Lord to be glorified. And you lift up my head. I don't lift my head selfishly in pride like I'm the greatest, like what they were arguing. The Lord lifts my head when I'm going through the pain and difficulty and lack of understanding and fearful moments. You take up I, the shield to, of faith. Of faith. That, that's right. Ephesians 6. You, you don't need a shield if you're not going forward. That's it. So it says, I lie down and sleep. Verse 5, I wake again. 
uh, no, well, I've skipped forward. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from, and I believe that holy hill, which I think is an uh, you know, indirect, direct moment to what Jesus would do on the hill, you know, as far as sacrifice, or he was looking back for all the sacrifices that that were given because of our sin. I mean, David had already concluded, that's why he's a man after God's own heart, that ultimately God would provide a way, uh, uh, you know, out from under our sins. Right. He would save us. So he says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side, which is why I went to this psalm. And the point I was making is we we pray our fears, we pray our emotions, even when we're angry, because he's obviously, he, he's surrounded. I mean, it doesn't look good, but he realizes God does his best work in these situations that seem overwhelming, because you go back to where we're at, Mark, because all things are possible. The bigger plan is more important. Nothing is impossible. We're going to be resurrected. We're going to live again. So then he says, Arise, O Lord, deliver me, verse 7. Strike all my enemies on the jaw and, and break the teeth of the wicked. And I made a point that he seems angry here. But, you know, when you're the most fearful is when you tend to lash out the most <laughs> in anger. Mm -hmm. From the Lord comes deliverance, which is the point. May your blessing be on your people which i do think in the end he had a loving attitude toward that i mean he was he was wanting the lord to deliver him but he wanted blessing on the people because two things that happen as a result of understanding what god wants for us is a love to god with all our heart soul mind and strength and a love for people so i was just trying to give an image of why i think they couldn't drive that demon out they were distracted they were worried about their own greatness they were not understanding the the death of jesus which was imminent i mean cause that's why he repeats it three times in in a chapter and a half here and so prayer is a powerful thing and they weren't asking jesus even twice two instances there from 32 to 34 they were just keeping quiet about it and they were afraid to ask him yeah david had one thing going for him without faith it's impossible to please god whoever comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him even in times when you're surrounded by enemies by the thousands <laughs> which is <clears throat> which any of us could find ourselves in right let's take another That's break so uh, one of the things that uh, guys notice when you see a picture of yourself, especially without a hat on, is, you know, that receding hairline, maybe a bald spot. I noticed at an event I was at recently because just the back of my head was showing up on the camera that was put up on the stage. And I could just see that, you know, white spot like it was looking down from the from space, you know, but. When we experience hair loss, uh, that's what happens. We begin to notice that, and especially if you're a young man, um, you know, under 35, uh, this can be a big life changer for you. So uh, one of our longstanding sponsors, uh, a company called Keeps, uh, their plan is to help you keep your hair, uh, and especially good for you young guys uh, that have early male pattern baldness. They have a clinically proven, FDA-approved hair loss treatment. It's all online, so there's no waiting rooms. You have to go somewhere to get it. Right there from your house, your couch, uh, you're able to get this product. they got medical uh, providers uh, that make sure the products are right for you and healthy and safe. They, uh, they're they available 24-7 to answer any questions that you have. So if you're ready to take some action about losing hair, uh, join thousands who have saved their hair with Keeps. Visit keeps.com slash door for 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash door. Keeps.com slash door. So, so Jace, it's interesting that you brought up David. That, that's why I wanted you to read that again, was because we talked about his situation, his life. He had always had this ability even from a young a teenager to to when times got tough he turned to god which is the whole idea because it's a father right that's his father and so he trusted him but you know i, I didn't think about it till you were just reading it that when you think about david now you know why that 
God said the everlasting kingdom, when it happens, it's going to happen through the house of David. Even way back then, he said that, you know, and they're really after David, there were a few decent kings, but for the most part, all the kings of Israel were not very good people and led Israel into a lot of trouble. And so he said from the house of David, and of course, Jesus, his lineage, the physical side of him comes through the house of David. So I think that spirit you were talking about of that childlike faith Mm -hmm. that Jesus brings into the earth, because I think this is a fascinating picture of Jesus that we don't think of very often that's in our text when he compares himself to the welcoming of this child. In other words, he's like, when you wrap your hands around me, when you love me, I am the child. It's another picture of Jesus. You were talking about all the resume of Jesus. He's also a child. Do you know why? Innocence. Never sin. That's so right. a child is innocent. That's why they'll, they'll believe you. I want my grandkids come in and if a storm comes up, they don't, they don't, well, they don't like storms. And they'll all come, and when it was like lightning outside, they're all three just right in my lap, just as close as they— it's my dogs. Exactly. And so— Thunders, and here they come. And why is that? Because they think you can protect them. Yep. Because they believe that. So that's this kind of concept that Jesus Well, they appreciate security, you know. They do. That's right. And all of us do. All my dogs jump up on the chair, and I haven't heard it yet. I haven't heard it. But they're listening. Dogs, listen— it's when thunders way off in the distance. That's right. Here they come. No, there's a lot of thing about kids you can. I mean, they forgive and they don't hold grudges. I mean, even in you know, they just they wake up the next day, and then you're you're their caretaker. You're yeah. I mean, it's so weird that you know later on that's not <laughs> that's not gonna happen. <laughs> we're gonna have a little notebook and we're like strike number four. Let's hold on to that grudge. Yep. They also imitate those who they they trust. You know, when you think about kids, they whatever you do, they're imitate. Which we know Jesus was the image of God. You know. Well, you yeah. allu- you alluded to this. So, go ahead, Zach. Yeah. Somebody told me one time uh, a youth minister here in Asheville that I'm friends with. The or actually runs a youth camp here, and um, I was talking about my boys and. He said, Zach, because this this guy's raised, I think, three or four boys. And he says, um, <coughs> he says, when your kids are younger, he said, it's, it's like your house. All the windows are about six foot up in the air. And you ha- and you have to tell them what it looks like outside. And you can pick them up sometimes and show them what it looks like outside. And he said, the, the day they turn 13 years old, he, he said, it's like your entire house becomes glass and they know everything. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, it's kind of funny because. I'm like, man, if you have a 13 year old kid, you know that just they just know everything and they're just belligerently. Uh, I mean, they're, I mean, it's a whole nother seventh grade is a weird deal, but but I think <laughs> this idea of being a kid is like if I tell if I tell my you know a two year old or three year old, whatever I tell him is outside, he's going to believe it. I could say, hey, there's a guy that that comes once a year and he can shrink down his entire body to fit and he's a big fat guy, but he can shrink down his entire body and fit into a chimney. And he shows up down at the bottom of the fireplace with a bag that he's got all the toys in the world <laughs> in this bag. And they're like, really? <laughs> you know, it's like the most absurd thing. They just believe you because they trust you. And I don't think that God is calling us to believe in something irrational, but I do think he, there's something in the heart of a child that there's an innocence and there's a trust. I think it's more about the trust the reason why, as we get older, we quit trusting is because we get hurt. And after you get kicked in the teeth a few times, you're like, you know what? I don't believe that you are truthful what you're saying. Because the last time I believed somebody when they said that, I ended up getting taken to the cleaners. And I'm not. So we do, we develop a hard shell around this. And the kids, it's like truly unadulterated trust, which, again, is a picture of who God is inside of his own nature, where you have a father and a son, which is interesting, right? You have a father and a son. God is eternally a father and a son, and there's a love between them, the spirit. But they never they never hurt each other. You want, you want to talk about what unadulterated trust looks like? Look inside the Trinity. Look inside the Godhead. Look at how God operates inside of himself. He, there's no lack of trust between the father and the son oh, right. because they, it's, a, it's impossible for them to hurt each other. And so when we get to this idea about little kids, I think it's, a, it's kind of a picture, a little— he gives us these little human glimpses on earth. Like, here's, here's just a little picture of what I'm like. 
And if you see the heart of a child and how they just will jump up in your lap and they will trust you and they will accept you and there's no there's no manipulation, there's nothing like, that's that's kind of like how I am. And if you want to get into my kingdom, it's this is what it's like in the yeah. kingdom. So you got to be like be like the kids. Well, there's a reason. Yeah, sorry, I, yeah there's a reason Jesus said you need to be born again because the kids they don't have any baggage, and you know baggage is what's causing a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in our society. And uh, it, it made me think, I mean, look, I had trust issues just like everybody else. And one of the contributors to that, I've shared this story before, probably a couple hundred podcasts ago. But when I was a kid, when I first told this story, it was the first time I'd ever told it because I was so embarrassed. But I saved my money. I was seven, eight years old, which we had no money. But I saved my money for months because at the back of a comic book, I saw an ad for nineteen ninety nine, you could get a a canister of shrinking dust, and the picture on the ad was a kid walking, and he had his parents in his pocket. They just just their heads were sticking out, <laughs> and I thought, you know what? That'd make my life a lot easier. If... And just... so I saved my money and sent that in the mail, and guess what? Ovaltine. It never arrived. <laughs> so somebody stole that twenty dollars because I was trusting and I was a kid. Whoops! <laughs> they conned me. Yeah, yeah they conned yeah. me out of twenty dollars. <laughs> but it Is also it, it also showed that I really believed that that product was available. <laughs> <laughs> and mom and dad are That's still funny. supersized through the whole thing. That's <laughs> let's, let's take yeah, another. That, let's yeah, ta- that, hang on, hang on, Zach. Let's take a break. So one of our new sponsors is, uh, it's kind of a fun thing to me. Uh, It's called Established Titles, and their purpose is to preserve the woodlands of Scotland. And uh, you know from previous podcasts, we've talked about our love of Scotland because that's our heritage and where we're from. We've actually been there and and filmed the the Little Duck Show. And so what they do is you, you purchase souvenir plots of land in Scotland, and then based on their historic Scottish customs, this allows you to become a lord or lady, or to be called a lord or lady uh, of, of Scotland, which is really cool. But the main thing is you're, they plant trees and they're preserving uh, these forests. So it's it's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing for Scotland, but it's also kind of fun uh, if you want to be referred to as the lord or the laird uh, in, in his old Scottish tongue. So the first 200 people purchasing a title pack uh, using our link will effectively be next to our plot. So you're within just a few minutes walking distance. So depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, uh, we can build our own little unashamed kingdom uh, in Scotland. It makes an amazing last-minute gift. Um, Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code Phil, you're going to get an additional 10% off. So check them out. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash Phil to get your gifts now and to help support the channel. So that's EstablishedTitles.com slash Phil. Yeah, yeah, it's like never again. Once you get hurt, you don't, you know, it's like, it's hard to go back and you think about like. Well, um, that's the cynicism he was talking about. That's when you start getting cynical, right? You start getting burned. Well, because don't underestimate months of that money. I mean, that was all I had that took months (laughs) to acquire and all my oh, yeah. hopes and dreams were dashed. But I mean, I think it was a good later on when I, you know, after I became a a son of God, I realized I'm glad that was a con because my idea yeah. of greatness was wrong. Not, not unlike the disciple. I thought, no, that would be great if I could just make anybody that crossed me <laughs> an inch tall. <laughs> and put them that's in your pocket. Awesome. That's that's real power. And that's for real twenty power. bucks, not even twenty, nineteen ninety five. Jason, I never heard that story before. I don't believe. I think I told you, but you probably weren't listening. But I don't know. I, don't know. I shared that on the podcast. It was a. I remember telling my wife about it. I was like, I had so, I did something really embarrassing one time, and I I told I, mean, I was just a kid, but I, you know, I had a comic book, and there was the ad, and I thought. But I just thought, what kind? Now I look back on it. What kind of twisted person <laughs> makes an ad designed at kids 
And 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 I mean, it's was it called not biblical, but it's called money grubbing scum. <laughs> well, they clipped me. So it's like a, it was, I, I compare it to the Christmas story, the movie they show every year, the the for twenty four yeah. hours. Remember that's why I said yeah. Ovaltine. So he, he like invests all his time into this, and they're sending him these little secret decoders, and he's working it out, and he's trying to figure it out. It it he decodes the message they've been giving him all these months of listening on the radio, and it's drink more oval team <laughs> well, i didn't know what you hey, meant look, by that look, it, I, you know i remember it being down ad. there at, at I, I was at y'all's house when i was about I, I remember when it happened to me for the first time i was probably about nine years old trusting nine-year-old i'm down at there at y'all's place and y'all had that one room with all the Dallas, dallas cowboy stuff in it and and one john gimber was there and i had a i had a pete rose uh, baseball card, and it was, I think it was a, 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 like a good one. And he convinces player. me, to, yeah, yeah, it was a rookie card. And he convinces me to trade him. Uh, it was Mookie Wilson for <laughs> Pete Rose. <Yeah. laughs> Bad trade. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and I and I'm convinced I got the the best deal until when the whole episode is over. Then I realize I'm looking in the little Be- uh, was it Beckett magazine? They had like uh-huh. the price of the, and I was like, oh my goodness, oh. I've just got taken to the cleaners. <laughs> and 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 I ne- and and I've never traded John Gimber anything <laughs> since then. You gotta watch ne- Gimber never again. You gotta watch Gimber on his trades, even as an adult. Sometimes you'll wind up on the wrong end of a choice. Or or, or in the same room, I was coached into that room to play a friendly game, a friendly game of something called Blind Man's Bluff with uh you guys and it's a pillow fight. What you think what how could you get harmed in a pillow fight until I realized you guys were taking like jeans and clothes and like you were winding down the pillowcase to where it was a, a ball of, of just solid density that you, and then y'all proceeded to just take our head, me and Jeff and any of the young kids. I mean, it was like a brutal Jeez, you gladiator were why sport. Did, why did you do stuff like that? And all of y'all that was so a mean. response to, to getting manipulated and bushwhacked at every turn. I mean, that's it. When I you, when you I was it, a you kid, you toughen up after a while. Yeah, you have your head on a swivel. <laughs> so I'm three, right? I You're mean, surrounded I'm, by enemies. But that's why I appreciate David in that psalm talking about he's relying on the Lord's glory and the Lord sustaining. You know, if we just try to figure all this out, especially when difficulties come our way, it, it, you're you're just gonna you're going to be fearful. Your, your plans are going to fall apart. I mean, life is brief and it's filled with a lot of persecutions and, and troubles trouble and difficulty and short and a lot of th- things are just not going to work. And look, God never promised a bed of roses here while on this life. Even, you know, when I read that from the rich young ruler, which I know we'll get into detail later, but when they were like, you know, Peter said, well, we've left everything to follow you. You remember that he was yeah. like, I mean, we got nothing. We're following you around. Right. And he said, you know, Jesus yeah. said, look, you'll you'll be blessed with homes and brothers and sisters and, you know, family and fields for me and the gospel. And you'll receive, you know, a hundred times that. But then he threw in one little thing and persecutions. Yeah. And when you fast forward throughout this life, look, it was difficult. Everything they had was taken away from them. They were persecuted and eventually murdered because of their faith. So if you look at this from a common sense approach, he's not removing the storm from our life. He's just giving giving us a shield as we go through it. I agree. Let's take our last last break, Zach. Yeah, and he's given us an anchor of hope. I mean, I think that's the thing we're we're latching on to something that's coming. And so when we talk about the kingdom, we we can say the kingdom is is already here but not yet fulfilled completely. And so we have morsels of it here. We have um things that are like echoes of the kingdom. We have tangible expressions of the kingdom here that we can we can see that we can taste, that we can partake in. One of them is this little kids. I mean, Jesus is like, got to be like these little kids. That's like, and, you, and if you have a little kid, we got to, you know, Ruth's two years old now. She's at that, I mean, so cute. And you just look at her and think, man, 
so much joy she brings to our life. But it's like those are little mor- morsels of the kingdom. Marriage can be a morsel. It can also be a, 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 a tangible expression of hell, too, if you're not careful. But you know, I think that what, what we're getting here is we're getting a picture of what it looks like. And so we, we're longing for a day when there will be no manipulation, all of the, the, the having your head on a swivel. Like like that kind of stuff, you know, like, yeah, we, well, that's how we are here and we're working to get out of that, but there will be a day that's coming and God does promise us this, that on that day, on the day when he's revealed in his, in his glory and we're caught up with him and we're, we're with all the other saints, we're, we're marveling at who this God is. We're going to live in relationships with people where not only do we not abuse each other, it will be impossible to abuse each other. It will be impossible to manipulate each other. It will be impossible to use each other. It will be impo- like all those things will be impossible. And so you want to talk about just complete unadulterated love that you can fully be exposed and not worry about ridicule, abuse or anything. I mean, that's what we're and that is, by the way, heaven, because that's who God is. That's what it means to bask and live in the presence of God. We and that finally, is the we price. finally gain peace of mind. Well, I think the the yep, I think the what Jesus was trying to walk the balance of is he he didn't want to crush his disciples' spirit because he chose them he he, but he's also he understands that they're missing the point here because we're human. Well, and Jace, look at how humble these guys are because Mark by Peter's telling is putting all this stuff in here. I mean, they make, they're, they're the ones who wrote the stuff that made them look terrible. Yep. But the reason why is because they're trying to show us, look, it's easy to miss. I mean, we missed it, you know, cause look at the yeah. next story in verse 38 mm-hmm. to your point, Jace, here, it's just another exact, they had just gotten through arguing about who's the greatest. And then in verse 38 teacher said, John, so this is now John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name. We told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. So if, in other words, if we are, can't argue about who's the greatest among us, we're greater than those people. Yeah. Do not, That's what human mm, beings do, though. That's what they, they do. compare themselves with other people. That's it's right. a legalistic basis. And so Jesus responds the same way as he has throughout this whole thing. Do not stop it, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Which, again, I just think it's that idea. I loved, Zach, your illustration earlier about how that Ruth has expanded the love capacity because I've seen it too, especially your older kids, because now they're giving as much love as they receive. And that's really what happens, yeah. right? I mean, that's well, that, that's well, the concept. Because love... Yeah, because creation, creation. When you create life, what you're creating is you're creating more worshipers, or God through us is creating more worshipers. And to define the word worship, it's to love. It's it's a, it's affection. It's it's affections that are pointed at something, and ultimately it should be God. But but mm-hmm. I, you know, when, when I was reading this about in in His name, if you if you give someone a cup of water to drink, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as follows the Christ. Truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. When we talk about doing things in the name of Jesus, like that's not just like a simple, like I say in Jesus name, what we're saying there is we're doing it like on it, it, on his behalf. We're doing it in the context of his will. And I think that's the point he's driving at here. Like, like that's not a, like you, you guys, like like you, what you mentioned, like you, you're you're way too caught up in these positions. And what we see is, is that if anyone should be caught up in, in a positional thing, it should be Jesus, because he is the ultimate position and that he is mm-hmm. the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, all the attributes that Phil mentioned in the yeah. sermon. And he is going to die. He is going to give up that position and take on humanity, or maybe not give up the position, but he's going to take on the, the position of humanity. Yeah, and so Romans, what we're being Romans called 12, to is humility. Yeah, Romans 12 brings it to light. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship, which is what you are alluding to. Yeah. Well, that's uh, why that's why Jesus died. 
gave his life for all of humanity. And guess who else died? All these disciples. All right. They gave their lives. Well, I wanted to read the last section because then he says, if anyone causes this 42, yeah. these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maim than with two hands and go to hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and are thrown into hell. All these things are true, but they're just very graphic. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's a quote from... Isaiah, I think. Um, no, Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah. So then it says this, because remember, he's redefining greatness, and he's looking, and you can say stuff like this when you just illuminated yourself and you're in the presence of people that have been dead hundreds of years. So it's not as graphic when you think about what they just saw. I mean, they're like, okay, they're trying to put, he's trying to get on to put, put the pieces together and i believe that he's trying to get them not to think less of themselves despite all their weaknesses and failings but to think of yourself less <laughs> i mean that that is the difference that's the the line that he's walking because then he introduces two things which i've i've made this point <clears throat> about him not promising them a life without pain and difficulty, because he says in 49, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. So I believe that right here, he has a moment for them that he's providing them their identity and their purpose. He's like, you're salt. And what is your purpose? Be salty. <laughs> and so it, it kind of helps understand if you read Matthew's version when he says uh, 513. This is right after again he says you're going to be persecuted. People are going to say all kinds of evil against you. This is going to be difficult. Remember when he gave them yep. the Beatitudes? Yep. Then he said you are the salt of the earth. There's your identity. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So when you think of this, to be salty, you got to be moving forward. You got to be shaking the salt. You can't just go dig a hole and hide out. And so then he has another illustration about the light. Just like you're the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Because there's a tendency when things get tough or you're going to be persecuted or you're going to be insulted or things are not going your way, there's a tendency just to quit. And that's that's what he's trying to say. He gives them this graphic illustration about even if you lose a hand or because they're, they're going to go to a place where these things are going to become real possibilities. Their bodies are going to be dismembered in various barbaric ways because of their faith in Jesus. So when you look at it in that context, you you can wrap your head around it, what he's trying to do. He's trying to build them up, not tear them down to where they're feeling like, well, I'm just, I'm just worthless. I can't get this right. So I think it's, <clears throat> it's interesting as we wrap up um, that he gets, when he's talking about what you just mentioned, Jason, read, he does it in the context of the little ones again. It's back to that concept of innocence and our behavior and how it relates to him. Because he goes back and says, if you, he's still got the little child there, you know, when this happens. And so he refers back to the child again about how we even treat children, which, by the way, in our culture is, you know, off the rails right now. It is. This verse certainly needs to be applied in our own culture. So we're out of time. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this concept because it is a pretty graphic thing. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in our overtime yeah. segment. If you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed. Right now there's a promo uh, going on. Use the promo code Phil. You get $10 off that subscription. So check it out. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. 
And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.